Hey guys, today we have Dr. Kalish. And Dr. Kalish, welcome and tell us a little bit about yourself. So I have a somewhat checkered past, uh, not really. I grew up in Berkeley, California, and I decided to become a naturopath in the early years of my life, except for they didn't license naturopaths in California at this time in history. And so I ended up becoming a chiropractor and going on and studying primarily with naturopaths for earlier part of my career, kind of on this trajectory, uh, which I didn't anticipate, which is becoming one of the leaders in functional medicine. You know, I really didn't plan on this happening, but just because of age, you know, I'm now one of the kind of elders. I have a, a functional medicine training program where we train a couple hundred doctors a year in how to do functional medicine. Now I'm on the, the faculty of the Institute for Functional Medicine. I teach their uh, practice implementation classes and I've done research studies with the Mayo Clinic. I've kind of been all over the map in terms of our industry. And uh, my my main kind of pride and joy right now is that I'm working with Dr. Richard Lord, who's the scientist that developed most of the testing that's now done in functional medicine. He was the original guy that did organic acids and fatty acids and the the main microbiome testing that we use now was developed by Richard. So I have a really strong interest in lab analytics and a really strong interest in teaching doctors how to organize their thoughts and prepare, you know, prepare effective, clinically effective programs for patients. And what, one of the biggest problems I see now is that the newer doctors coming into our field don't know how to design therapeutically effective programs. And there's not a lot of really great education out there. So that's kind of the effort that I'm leading right now in my, at this point in my career. Awesome. Well, talk about what are what do you think are the main benefits of intermittent fasting and regular fasting or extended fasting? Well, I guess you start with the premise that Americans compulsively overeat. Yes, and, they you know, do. <laughs> right. And we developed this, we developed this term called snacking, which basically means compulsively overeating not only your meals that are too large, but then compulsively overeating between meals. If you travel, as I have to other parts of the world, a lot of there's a lot of cultures where the snacking is just not even ever considered as an option, right? I love I mean, that. They, I, you just have to go to France to figure that one out. You don't have to go to some weird country in you know South America or, or Africa or something. It's like even in Western modern countries, you know, there's whole cultures where people just don't snack at all. And they often, you say the French is an example, barely eat breakfast. You know, I don't know if you consider a cup of coffee of breakfast or not, but you're a train station in anywhere in France and you'll just see everyone's having a cup of coffee and then poof, they're off on their day. And that's, you know, basically their breakfast. So I think this is not an unusual or strange idea. You know, it's been embraced by many cultures in many different ways. And um, when I was living, you know, I spent about two years in a monastery in Thailand, in Southern Thailand. And one of the things that the traditional Buddhist monks do, and I did this for two years, is they eat one meal a day. And you can never eat anything after 12 noon. That's the basic rule. So wow. They have, and they've been doing that for 5,000 years. And Buddha just was like, hey, guys, you know, chill out. No, no food after noon. And you can have one meal in the morning around when the sun comes up. And so the traditional Buddhist monks have been doing that literally for thousands of years. And we didn't call it intermittent fasting. That was just like, monastery life, you know, and um, you get used to it, right? And it, it ends up after a while that your blood sugar stabilizes and your body starts to, you know, kind of accommodate to this pattern. I think, I mean, there's so many profound effects of it. The, the one that's obvious is that it gives your digestive tract a break from digesting because your digestive tract has lots of other jobs to do, including running detoxification systems, repairing itself, growing out the good bacteria. I mean, it's like, um, it would be like if you bought a car, if you brought a, let's say a nice car, like a McLaren or a, you know, a Ferrari, and you just turned on the motor and just ran it 24 hours a day. No one does that, right? You drive those cars intermittently because they're really nice cars. You want them to last. And so if you want your gut to last, you want your body to last. If you're compulsively overeating, you're just wearing your system out at an accelerated rate and you're not giving your body a chance to repair. I love those examples. So my husband, before I started doing intermittent fasting, you know that song, all I do is win, 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 no matter what? Like he would literally, I would 
go after, like we'd just be done with dinner and I'd just be like, I want something else. I want something else. And he'd be like, all I do is snack, 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 no matter what. Because I just used to love to snack. And I love that you said that. It's like, we have to get out of this idea of snacking um, because it's just, it's over the top. It's a now, form of entertainment. Yes. It's not a form of nourishment, right? I think the one thing yes. we, we need to separate in our minds nourishment from nurturing, you know? So food is very nurturing. That's the whole idea of comfort foods, right? Um, but we should be getting our nurturing, like from other people, I don't know, from your pet, if you're a dog person, from trees, wherever you want to get your nurturing. It shouldn't be coming from food. Food is just for nourishment. So I hear the question a lot, you know, does 20 calories of coffee creamer hurt my fast? And different people have different takes on it. So when you are fasting or when you're suggesting people to fast, how important do you think it is to just be on a complete clean fast where you're just not having anything? Or there are some people who say, you know, the general rule of thumb is anything you have under 50 calories, your body kind of still remains in, in a mostly fasted state. And do you agree with that or what do you think? Yeah, that's probably partially true. I mean, the other thing that's more true is if you're chewing and having to digest it in your stomach or not. Because what you're trying, a lot of what you're trying to do is just give your digestive, well, think about it. When you eat, when you eat a meal, it, you chew your food, it hits your stomach. In your mouth itself, you're making all these enzymes and saliva, then your stomach has to make hydrochloric acid, and then it hits your small intestine, your pancreas gets involved, and it makes pancreatic enzymes, and your gallbladder has to make bile, and then your small intestine has to start you know, squeezing everything, and it's a huge amount of work. It's like putting a car through a car wash, you know, one of those big car washes you drive through. It's like a lot of work going on, right? And if you start chewing something, then that whole process gets initiated. And if you have a couple of sips of coffee with some cream in it, I don't think it's going to make a big difference. Um, I mean, if you had a milkshake, it would probably be enough, even though it's liquid, right? It would probably be enough to crank up your digestion. But what you're trying to do is just keep your digestion in a quiet place. And I don't think you need to be paranoid about the little details like that. Um, as long as you're not chewing large amounts of food um, and you're uh, you're not doing too much in the way of fat. I mean, I guess the cream is a little bit of a dicey one, but a little bit of cream in the coffee, I don't think it's going to matter. Okay, awesome. And I love that what you just said. It's different, you know, drinking those 20 calories than eating those 20 calories as well. So you're not starting yeah. that digestive tract going. I love that. And that means you shouldn't chew gum either. Mm. Because right, like chewing that. gum makes your body think that you're eating. Now, talk to us a little bit because, you know, I have the podcast that I do and we have tons of people who come in and ask questions. And one of the things they ask is they say, they say, my husband, you know, let's say it's a husband and a wife. And they say, my husband and I both decided to do an eight hour window where we're only eating in an eight hour window, fasting the rest of the time. And the men are always losing weight. And the women in an eight-hour window, sometimes they are, but more times they're not. Once they start moving down to a six-hour window or less, it seems like they then the women start losing weight. So talk to us a little bit about that. Well, intermittent fasting and weight loss are totally separate subjects. Mm, good. And the reasons why intermittent fasting is healthy have nothing to do with weight loss. A whole yeah. totally different subjects. And maybe that's being confused by people out there. I didn't realize yes. that. But yeah, intermittent fasting is one thing you do to get healthy and to be healthy and to keep your gut lining intact and to do all kinds of great things for your microbiome and all this other stuff. Separate from that entirely is how people lose weight and why they lose weight. Um, so yeah, like Buddha didn't tell his monks and nuns to only eat once a day so they would get skinny. It was more about spiritual enlightenment, right? Yes. And and so um, clearly, right? That was the whole point. That's why people become monks and nuns. They're not doing it so they can be thin. Now, look, think about it. They wear those big robes. You can't even see what their bodies look like. Yeah. <laughs> so there's nothing. True. Intermittent fasting should be separated entirely in everyone's minds from weight loss. But now, okay, so uh, acknowledging that we're doing that, why do women lose weight differently than men, right? Whether they're intermittent fasting or not. Um, well, because women have double the number of fat, sparing enzymes as men do. So if you think about it like um, uh, 
if you're if you're in a group like like the Donner Party, I don't know if you ever heard that story in California in the eighteen mm-hmm. hundreds, and this group of settlers got trapped in the Sierras in in Northern California, and they basically starved to death, right? Then they started to eat each other. It's like some TV movie made about it a while ago. But, you know, the women survive. So in times of starvation, because men burn fat quickly, men are relatively expendable. If you have a tribe of a couple hundred people, you only need one or two men to keep going, right? If all the women are dead, you're pretty much over forever. So women have much better survival mechanisms, and they store body fat twice as efficiently as men. And so it's a good thing, you know, from that perspective that women are just hardier by design and men are relatively expendable. Um, Now, in an era where there's excess calories, it is kind of like jokes on you type situation where women just struggle more with weight because their their whole body is geared to store fat efficiently for survival, right? Um, So if, uh, now if, uh, let's just take women, a woman by herself, not in relation to another man. Let's say 10 women are doing intermittent fasting together and five of them are losing weight and five aren't, right? Um, forget about the male-female differences, then you've got sluggish metabolisms, right? There's some people who just don't have fat-burning metabolisms that are functioning well. And that's one of the things that we look at with these labs that I specialize in. We actually measure the fat-burning system. And you'll see in, you know, I don't know, 23% of people we measure at least, they have major problems burning fat in terms of nutrients like carnitine being deficient and in terms of the mitochondria not working well. Let's just take a minute and let's talk about my latest discovery. Listen, this is the hottest super nutrient packed product that's going to boost your brain and your overall well being. First of all, as soon as I tried this product, I became a fan of it and was blown away by the immediate result. I felt focused, my mind was clear, it just doubled my mental performance. So, This product has the superpowers of mushroom extracts and collagen. So it has four of the best health boosting mushrooms. It's got lion's mane, chaga, cordyceps, and reishi, collagen, and Peruvian cacao. So when you combine all of these, the four mushrooms and the collagen, it is going to energize your brain and your body. It's called Kala Genius. So check it out, newtopia.com slash wasteawaygenius and use the code wasteaway10 during checkout. So talk about the mitochondria just a little bit and how that does put into play how weight loss is happening. Yeah, so the mitochondria are the portions of your cells that take fat and burn it up for fuel. And without the mitochondria, you'd be dead, you know, probably in a few seconds, maybe, maybe, maybe you survive like 30 seconds, maybe a minute. So when you take a deep breath in and you inhale oxygen, that oxygen is going to your mitochondria so you can make energy. So if you imagine what it's like, if your mitochondria aren't working, just hold your breath for a few minutes and see how you do, right? There's really, these are not optional systems of mitochondria or, you know, absolutely required for your brain, for your liver, for your heart, for everything to work. And so what they actually do is they take fat and they take carbohydrate and they can take protein and they burn those nutrients up, those macronutrients up. They convert them into energy, right? And if your mitochondria are working well, it means your metabolism is working properly and then you're going to have calories in and calories out working, right? So you know if you cut your calories by a certain amount, you're going to lose a certain amount of body fat. And if you are not having that equation working, right? And you're like on a starvation diet and you're eating 500 calories a day and you're still not losing weight or you're intermittent fasting and you're still not losing weight. It means that you're not burning fat very well. Now, again, from a survival perspective, maybe this isn't a bad thing. If you were starving to death, you'd be happy that you were not burning fat well, right? But in an era where we want to slim down, this kind of works against you. So we do these labs and and one of the main ones is called an organic acids test. And it measures all these aspects of fat burning. We see where the defects are. Then we use nutritional supplements to normalize metabolism. And that gives people more energy, helps their brain work better, eliminates brain fog, helps a lot with chronic pain syndromes, helps people lose weight. A lot of things happen when your mitochondria start to work properly. And when they're not working well, people gain weight, get tired, they get a little depressed, get kind of sluggish. And it's really hard for them to exercise or get the benefits of exercise because 
even if they're working out well, again, this metabolism is damaged, it's sluggish, it's not working right. Yeah. So let's talk about, I love what you said earlier. That was so good, is that we have to separate the health aspect from the weight loss aspect. Because most people, I think, they look at the weight loss aspect, but there's so many health benefits. And I want you to talk to us a little bit. I think that's so intriguing that you, so you, did you actually physically spend two years with those monks? Yeah, I did. That is amazing. So talk to us a little bit about that and a little bit about the health benefits um, maybe that you even experienced because you were only eating one meal a day that whole time you were there, correct? Yeah. Well, so I lived in two different monasteries. One was called Wat Suan Mok. It was in Southern Thailand. And at that monastery, we had a 10-day silent retreat every month. So it was 10 days of total silence. No talking, no reading, no writing, no eye contact, just straight up meditation. If you're on the lightweight program, maybe 12 hours a day, the heavy duty meditators like myself were like 18 hours a day of meditation. And then um, that monastery, you had the morning break, the morning meal at, at, at sunrise. And then you could have, if you were like kind of a, a wimp, you could have a second little snack at 11 a.m. There's another monastery I lived in, northern Thailand, much stricter, Wat Panana Chat. And they were like, oh, no way. You know, you have a meal one meal at 5 a.m. and that's it. Um, and so, the, I mean, it's a discipline, but when everyone around you is doing it and there's no food available anyways, there's, you know, the, you don't really get hungry. That kind of goes away. I, like I said earlier, I think a large portion of why we eat and how we eat and who we eat with all revolves around using food as entertainment. And when you take that off the, off the option list and no one is eating, then you just do other things, right? Um, to interact with other people. I don't know what you do, play a game of cards or just talk about life or whatever it is that you do. We just, you know, things don't center around food. Um, and like I said earlier, the, the monks don't do intermittent fasting for health reasons. Not really. For it's a it's a matter of, you know, controlling your appetites, like literally, right? And getting control over your mind and having an understanding that that hunger is not even real anyways, is it? You know, and and you sort of having discipline over the body so the body doesn't control you, right? And obviously they have the whole other rule, there's no sex, right? There's no extra eating. They're really trying to focus your energies on spiritual life. And I think that part of what the Buddhists discovered or Buddha discovered 5,000 years ago is that food is a distraction from deeper spiritual states. And I think also anyone who does yoga or has meditated a lot or people that do intermittent fasting feel, you can tell, right? That if you're overeating, you're just slowing your system down. Forget about weight, whether you're gaining weight or not. You're just um, mentally sluggish. And, you know, when you're a little hungry all the time, just puts an, an edge on your life in a good way, right? It makes you more aware um, and less sort of turned, tuned out. I think, yeah. that's, I think that's why the, the monks do that. And, um, so, you know, tradition has been going on for thousands of years. It's, uh, it's an interesting idea. They do allow coffee and tea in the afternoons and evenings. Wow, that's oh. that's really cool. So, talk about the microbiome for a second. And do you think that fasting helps the the microbiome? And why or why not? Yeah, so I've been studying this a lot lately. Um, this is based on Richard Lord's work on the microbiome, Dr. Lord. Uh, we basically, every time you eat a, a meal, that me did you ever do like high school biology class where you had like a petri dish and you grew yes. up stuff? Did you do that? Yeah. Remember, and you like you put something in the dish and you come back a few days later and you can't believe how much the bacteria grew. Yes. So that happens in your digestive tract every time you eat a meal. There's this exponential growth where the bacteria in your gut go from thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands, like trillions of soof. It's just a, basically your gut is a big fat Petri dish, right? Mm. For bacteria to grow. It's like a fermenter. Um, if anyone's ever made beer and you've seen things ferment. And so when every time you eat a meal, as that food goes through your digestive tract, one of the primary things that happens is it stimulates the growth of either good or bad intestinal organisms. So if you eat like a lot of inflammatory foods or a lot of sugary foods 
or excessive carbohydrate, you're going to promote the growth of yeast and bad bacteria. And if you eat vegetables and fruit and beans and some healthy grains and maybe some meat if you're a meat eater, then you're going to stimulate the growth of the good bacteria. Meat is actually kind of neutral. Meat and fat don't help the microbiome that much. It's primarily things like vegetables, fruits, and beans. And so the more of those kind of plant-based foods that you eat, the more the good bacteria start to proliferate. And there's all kinds of research now which that shows that some of these gut bacteria command and control our obesity levels, right? So the the they regulate metabolism basically. And they they can even there's just some fun funny experiments they've done where they take mice, it's always a mouse, right? And they put, you know, the fat mouse's microbiome in the skinny mouse and the skinny mouse gets fat. And then they take the skinny mouse's microbiome and put it in the fat mouse and the fat mouse gets skinny. So it turns out that the bacteria, and there's these ones called Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes, are really strongly uh, impacting um, how we're burning calories and, and how our metabolism is being regulated. So it's not just that fruits and vegetables and beans are good for you and that they have all these nutrients. A lot of why they're good for us is because of how they impact the microbiome. And the more out of balance your microbiome is, the more your body's going to store, again, you know, store body fat. Wow. Now, are there any supplements that you would recommend that you would say these supplements really make a huge difference on your microbiome? Oh, yeah. Well, you can get all this stuff from food. That's not true. Yeah, yeah, it's true for the most part. So you can get all these things from food, but the obvious ones are um, probably in the order of importance, some kind of fiber, right? That you could get from food or you can get from a supplement. Um, what's very popular now are what are called prebiotics. You know, rather than probiotics, these prebiotics are the substrate that your gut bacteria need to grow. And so a lot of the companies now are coming out with prebiotics and they're going to have things in them like polyphenols, these special kind of sugars that the bacteria need to grow. So fiber, prebiotics, obviously probiotics, you know, have been around forever and they can help. And then um, there's a new product that's on the market the last couple of months. It's called butyrate. And butyrate is a short chain fatty acid. And butyrate is the main byproduct of the intestinal bacteria breaking down fiber. And butyrate's really great for people with more chronic and severe digestive problems. Um, that's kind of been a revolutionary new supplement that came on the market maybe three, four months ago. So let me ask you, because for me, beans, you know, I like beans, but they never do well with me. Like no one really likes to be around me when I'm eating beans. And I literally feel like the second I eat beans, I'm getting my stomach is bloated and disdented and, and so forth. So what would you say would be some of the causes for that? So there's different groups of gut bacteria. I, you know, I kind of classify them. This is actually Richard Lord's work. Classify them in, um, classify them. Oh, there you go. We lost you there for a second. Mm -hmm. Classify them. We classify, um, what was I thinking about? Uh, well, we classify the gut microbiome in these different functional groups, right? So there's a primary group of gut bacteria that feed on fiber, the, especially the type of fiber that's found in beans. And those gut bacteria make butyrate, which is incredibly important for your immune system and as an anti-inflammatory and a gut healing product. But they also release hydrogen gas, right? So people get gassy and bloated. However, there's another equally important group of gut bacteria that live on hydrogen gas. Okay, So if you eat beans, you get gassy. It means you don't have enough of the hydrogen consuming bacteria in your gut. So, so would that butyrate help? For me, taking butyrate, you can do but butyrate is like a miracle cure for everything. Oh, okay. Yeah, butyrate is incredible for everything. But what's more important is because you don't want to get addicted to a supplement. I mean, you can use butyrate for the short term, right, to okay. kind of figure this out. But in the long term, you would just start with like maybe a tablespoon of lentil soup a day. So you get a tiny amount of the fiber from beans. That will give you your body time to get used to that hydrogen, and for those hydrogen consuming bacteria to start to grow. That makes sense. So it's just, a, it's like a, it's like using beans as a supplement kind of to get the microbiome to grow out more fully. 
but just go really gradually, even like a tablespoon of soup a day. So you, because you're going to gradually get be able to handle more and more of it as your gut gets healthier. I love that. So you're just saying, look, get some lentil soup, take a tablespoon or two a day, because that is the thing. Because in the past, I probably have eaten too many beans at a sitting when I do have it. And then I'm like, oh, I feel miserable. So I've really just avoided them. Now you're saying just take one tablespoon, two tablespoons, do it every day until your body starts really getting used to being able to process it. Exactly. And that is actually one thing about in terms of weight loss. I mean, that's kind of a weight loss idea because as you get the microbiome balanced, you're going to get your metabolism corrected and those organisms that are helpful for burning fat are going to come up in numbers. Awesome. Well, this has been so fascinating. I've really enjoyed spending time with you today. Tell people how they can find out more about you and how to follow you. Yeah. So um, kalishwellness.com, K-A-L-I-S-H wellness.com. You can check out my website. And if you're interested in doing lab testing and learning more about functional medicine, I do patients uh, all the time over the phone primarily to work with people all over the world. That's awesome. Well, thanks again for being with us. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.